House of the Dragon. Yeah, so it ended uh, the eighth episode. This season was not as good as the first season. Like, I felt like yeah. the first season told a nice, complete story. A deeper story, too, I think. Don't get me wrong. I think I li- I liked a lot of it. And it, it kind of, um, like we were talking about Better Call Saul, I, I, I kept thinking about that, how they... You were saying how like they followed the characters to their like detriment, <laughs> like yeah. where they didn't start going. Away. I feel like a little bit of that this season where they yeah. they were trying too hard to make everybody everybody like realistically reacting to things that I think they started to go in circles a little bit. The last two episodes were the episode where they are trying to find dragon riders, and so finally a, a lot of these uh, you know NPCs that we've been following like throughout the season you finally understand that oh they're dragon riders and so they so they basically f- round up a bunch of like small folk that they think might have valerian blood and they're like here here to look at these dragons maybe you're riders probably who, who, whose mother or father had sex with you know royalty at some point and that was i mean i thought that last scene was like it was like jurassic park or some shit you right it's like they were in the dragon pit and uh, there were some really cool shots. And I thought that, that was probably one of the, that like that, that whole sequence and the, the battle in the middle of the season yes. um, with, with the dragons and where Aegon comes in and gets uh, roasted by Aemond. For the Jurassic Park, for the Jurassic Park thing, are you thinking of the shot where the three dragons with the bastards on them are behind her at Dragonstone and she's like ready to to, to wage war like the it was the end of the second to last episode the, that last shot kind of the terror of them going throughout the dragon like the because there was the hugh hammer guy who was like the blacksmith of the beard yeah and he was like in the dragon pit and like people were getting like eaten and uh it, it had like a little bit right, of a right. t-rex t-rex vibe that uh, was cool those dragons man the, the the vfx on the dragons this season are crazy yeah it's it's amazing you can see where all the money went because yeah. they're it's gore like you, it's seamless you don't even think about it like how and each of them have different personalities that you can tell yes like i think that's that i think that's one thing i really like is the attention to detail where i can tell the like the way Hugh Hammer reacted to his dragon that he eventually claims. And then there's that, um, uh, Ulf the white, who's kind of like the, 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 the kind of the funny, uh, small folk guy who claims a dragon, his dragon kind of claims him. And it's like, so there's, you can tell they're like, they're, they're like animals. Like each dog has a different personality. It's really and cool. They, yeah. I feel like Renera's character at the end was, a kind of treading water, I would say. I think of all the characters, Damon probably had the one with the best arc. I know he was just in a spooky castle for most of the season, but there was a lot of interesting um, growing moments that he had. Because remember when he, the the young River Lord comes where his dad dies and the young liver lord comes and you know Damon has pissed off everybody. And this young, like uh, the young Tully, I think his name is Grover Tully. Grover, it's it's some Sesame Street name. Super Tully. <laughs> <laughs> Damon's like fucking everything up. Like the people are mad at him because he like he uh, he sent these people to like fight and they they're they're raping everybody. And then this this kid comes and he's like, "Here, let me help you. Like you have to like um, show that you're serious. You can't just be brute strength. Yeah, you you got a PR problem. I gotta solve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you so you can't just like. Cause he want cause throughout the season he's like you you have to call me king and you don't know if he's trying to like take over for Renera he's he had a lot of moments where he's like do I even want to be king and he's getting having those dreams where his brother is like showing he's like holding the crown it's like look at the the weight of this crown like do you want this and and so to, the payoff at the end is where he finally is like no I'm going to serve my queen so yeah um, he he relinquishes this desire that he's been holding on. And that he's been dealing with for so long and he's actually going to serve. It's like a self, it's like a moment of self acceptance. Like I, um, I really do poorly on my own when leading and I'm really not an inspired leader. And I really, my place is actually here as one of your, um, you know, combatants. Yeah. Because he is a brute. He is, 
he he doesn't understand like how, how to how to lead you know renair is obviously overly cautious and people are frustrated with that but she does understand the nuances of those things so um yeah it's there like, like i said there's so many good character moments and it does feel like they they build up all the armies they're all coming together and then it just ends <laughs> so it's just like, <laughs> yeah well i i suppose if the more satisfying ending would be that the the war that the whole season had been building to gets underway or something, but instead it's, it just teases war, which the cliffhanger for the season one teased war as well. Like, Oh, now war is inevitable. But of course he did get some in the middle of the season. What, what would you say? Like I would describe season one. If somebody said like, tell me what, what is the story about? I would say, it's about a family falling apart. It's about it's about a father who couldn't keep the family together. That's like what the heart of season one. And I think that's why season one resonates with people is because even though there's like all all the plot details going on that that like, you know, the king can't keep his family together. His legacy is going to be tarnished because he wasn't able to keep his family together. That um, really shines through. What's season two? What's the story? It's like tensions are rising. It's harder to say in like a couple sentences because yeah. tensions are rising, but also Renera doesn't really want to get into war and Allison is trying to find herself and and Damon's in a spooky haunted castle and he's trying to grapple with his problems. So it's just, it, there's, it, there's a lot of cool stuff, a lot of good character stuff, but yeah, it doesn't have a tight, hook narrative hook yeah a deep and it's not as deep as it was in the first season and, and and yeah as you said there's like a lot of there's pockets of depth and there's lots to you know and there's christian there and uh you know sir Otto, and there's there's lots to be excited about but yeah i think i think that's the reason you don't you don't hear people quite as thrilled about it as they were the first season although the ratings are very good i'm looking at the the nielsen chart from last week Top 10 and House of the Dragons, number one, uh, and then Bluey right after it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know that you, you you mentioned Kristen Cole. And yeah, he had a like, I think his scene in that last episode was like so good. It was like so well acted. And so like it had great dialogue. And it's like you could see you like got him. You got his he he knows he's like kind of a, a flawed man and this is the course that he set upon and he he was the when he was like talking about it's like like when it wouldn't it be a relief to like like die in battle or something. It's like, dude, you've <laughs> you're 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 in a dark place, the buddy. To die will be a kind of relief. Then you think? Yeah, well, I, I, what I was hearing him say was like, you know, he was reflecting on the inevitability of death, and and given that it's inevitable, um, should I really be as wrapped up in all of these minor details in in this life as I am? Like he he was having a, a little existential crisis. Alson's brother there was like about to kill him, but he's he he brought him he brought him back down. He's like, like oh, you know, all right, never mind. <laughs> he's like, you're right. We all are gonna die. Okay, yeah, let's go. That's good. So I definitely I recommend it for sure. I mean, beautifully shot, beautifully performed, beautifully written. It's really good stuff. It's just yeah, it, but you know, if I imagine it's the kind like when the show is done, you won't mind the season quite as much. It'll be if you yeah. were binging it from beginning to end. I imagine. Because I, I can I can think of seasons of Better Call Saul that were kind of like that too, where it felt like the last season, you know, uh, teased him becoming Saul, and then like you go through a whole season of new plot, and you're like, wait, like I feel like we're, but actually everything is kind of zigging and zagging towards something. Hopefully they'll stick the landing. Yeah, I mean, because there is a story that's already written, and I guess uh, I think season three and four are already greenlit, so we'll get an ending. We'll get an ending, so I we'll see how it all all. I mean, it's still a good journey. It's just that it's 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 only a disappointment when you look at it from the first season. Yeah. What about King Aegon's dick? It got no, oh, yeah, it, it got exploded in fire. Got up. It burst in the flames like a sausage on a spit. Do not despair, Your Grace. There are better days ahead. But even that, that's even that scene where uh uh what's his name? The Lord Lord Lars Strong and he's trying to convince him to be like they can they'll call you the rebuilder, they'll call you this. He's like, I'll be the realm's delight. Like 
walking him off. There's so many good scenes with char- like character work. So good. Yeah. Some people being genuine, some people being manipulative, smart, smart writing. And I, I can, I continue to prefer it strongly to game of Thrones. Game of Thrones definitely had its moments. Don't, don't get me wrong. And it, it, it had a lot of intrigue and stuff, but I, I, I just, there's something about these characters and these circumstances that hook me more. What I liked about Game of Thrones was the intrigue and the character work and stuff like that. And then once it started to get into a plot machine, that's when it it stopped, it lost me. And it, it it felt like the characters lost something at some point along the way too. Like they became like caricatures of themselves at a certain point. Yeah, cause it, yeah. Well, I think a lot of that came from they ran out of stuff to adapt. So what they did was they just repeated phrases and mannerisms from previous seasons. So they became, yeah, flanderized a little bit. Flanderized. What a great term for those who don't know it. It means, yeah, it's when a show has been going on for a little while, you have a character that's kind of three dimensional, but then they sort of become two dimensional as um, the audience only knows them for kind of like the highlights about them. They become a caricature of themselves. Uh, I feel like you could apply that same notion to things like, you know, in the force awakens, all you saw were, were like X wings and tie fighters. You didn't see any of the other spaceships. You didn't see, you know, it was like, it was just like a caricature of star Wars, you know? Right. It, it, things sometimes go that way where, where only the most prominent memories or the most prominent qualities of something perpetuate and everything that, that gave it richness kind of goes away. There's a channel called uh, David Stewart. He, he's a guy who he's a novelist and an academic, and he always has really interesting insights about, like Hollywood and writing. And um, he did a really interesting video about he went to Disneyland recently and he was surprised to hear how many, to see how many people were normal. were like normies. There weren't like a lot of weird people at Disneyland, which he, he, got, he had gotten really used to, but uh, he's, he's the kind of guy I'd love to have him on this show sometime. But um, he did a video called why is Hollywood writing so bad now? And his answer essentially was simple. It was, well, because you don't have to have great writing to have a hit. And a lot of movies that have great writing are not hits. So like even blockbuster movies that where they spend a lot on the writer, it's still only like a hundred thousand dollars for you know that one movie. And like, you know, he's like staff writers and, and a lot of TV shows are pretty, pretty low paid, you know, like writing is just not one of those things that's valued all that much in Hollywood, frankly, um, because it's just, it's a, it's a non-essential piece of of what brings people into a theater or to watch a show although i think for a show it would be easy to argue that like if if the writing's bad like people are gonna bow out you know yeah i think writing is way more important for a show yeah um even if it's kind of like like there's a lot of like formulaic shows that i think have great writing you know it's like um i'm thinking about like old sitcoms and stuff you know yeah. where it's, yeah, like, it's good writing a lot of times they get yeah, they yeah. get into like really good grooves and yeah they get they really know their characters and they really like have a good energy to them um yeah and so i i think there that's a skill in itself so i don't think you can get away with being like i don't know that just you, you need to be, yeah, yeah. So it's spectacle in a show. I mean, there's some shows that do that, and especially, uh, you know, HBO shows can sometimes do that, but they end up not being very memorable. Yeah, and he he was saying he was like, you know, and probably the reason Game of Thrones was as good as it was was because George R. R. Martin really went above and beyond to write a fully realized world, and he's like, shocker, as soon as they stopped producing his content, it wasn't as popular, you know. Uh, now we're gonna wait two years for the war to start. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the only frustrating thing. But hey, man, when when it comes to expensive TV shows, it's it's a ten year investment in a lot of cases, or it can be. It was for Game of Thrones. It was for the Breaking Bad universe. And then then we're gonna get Rings of Power in a few weeks. <laughs> oh fuck! <laughs> <laughs> and it's really a losing battle for me, isn't it? Because. I don't want to watch it. I'll watch it for the sh- for the podcast so that we can talk about it. The, the The views will be low on those talks, and the people that comment will say, "I don't know why you keep watching this. It's bad. Stop watching it." You know. So what the fuck am I doing? I don't know. I'm gonna watch it. I thought the first <laughs> season. I thought the first season was great. Yeah. <laughs> it was so oh, sh- shitty. But you have not seen what I've seen. I have seen my share. You have not seen what I. I have seen my share. You have not. 
I have... You have not seen what I've seen. You have not seen what I have seen. Such trash. And it's, <laughs> it, it, it is a, a, a certain... Fa- it's a fascinating kind of trash because it's so expensive. Yeah, it's it's like... It, well, the first... I don't know. I think they... I don't think the second season is as expensive, but I haven't looked at the numbers. But yeah, the first season was exorbitant amounts of money and like and it didn't really show because the costumes looked like trash the it didn't seem very well shot it was just expensive subscribe to red cow entertainment on patreon for full episodes every other week